Kiora, and welcome to Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. Let me be your guide as we take a walk into the shadowy realms of the unexplained, of the paranormal, of things that go bump in the night and haunt your dreams. Your host? I'm Mary Ann. Thanks so much for joining us today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you're living in this beautiful world of ours. Sit back, relax. And let me be your guide as we walk into the Shadowlands together and see what awaits us there. Hi everyone, if you were to ask someone what the term black-eyed kids refers to, there's a good chance that the person you are asking has at the very least heard of the term, even if they may not know what it actually refers to. So for those listeners who don't really know about them, I'll give a description of what a black-eyed kid is. These kids, and most reports have them as children or very young teens, from around 6 to 16 years of age, all are reported as generally having very pale skin or a death-like paleness. They may be wearing normal clothing, or their clothing may be extremely old-fashioned and dated, or inadequate for the weather conditions. For example, thin summer clothing in the middle of winter. They have fully jet black eyes without any sclera or whites, iris or pupils. These children most generally appear at night, but not always. They often knock at doors or windows asking to be let in or car windows and parking lots or even approaching people out walking or as in the case of my friend's son's experience whilst out doing a river walk in the middle of the day in a fairly isolated area. They ask to be taken somewhere or to borrow the phone or call some adult or even to use the toilet. Their voices can be monotonous or they can have a very high-pitched giggle. And with every encounter they have, without exception, the witnesses, even strong armed force members who have had encounters with them, are all overwhelmed by feelings of irrational, unexplainable fear and often feelings of danger. This is generally before they even see the children's eyes. So, with that brief description of these children, are you ready to take a walk with me into this part of the Shadowlands and see what awaits us there? Let's begin. Where do these children come from and what are they? There are many, many theories about these mysterious black-eyed kids. Theories such as them being interdimensional beings, extraterrestrial beings from UFOs, vampires. I tend to feel this theory is because they have to ask to be let in and cannot seem to enter without permission. Or demonic beings. Other theories say that they are merely an urban legend, a totally fictitious story that has taken on a life of its own, as some urban legends do. But no one really knows. Another theory has its basis in science, that it could be an overreaction on the part of the witness who had been primed to see such a being. Kolob and Wishaway, 2008, say that priming is where a pre-suggestion is already in the person's mind and it only needs a very vague activator stimulus in the right circumstances to be able to set off a connection between the person's knowledge already in their brain and their senses, making a false connection between the two. This leads to a flawed conclusion that isn't supported by evidence. This happens quite often when listening to EVPs, for example, electronic voice phenomena. Voss, Fedemar and Paola in 2012 suggest that priming is very tied to paradelia, which is the unification of sensory data into a familiar subject based on the perception of complex lines, patterns, gradations, sounds or random colours. So, priming, paradelia, a frame of reference such as movies, books and context – all of these things combined play really important roles in how we personally see events, experiences and even other people and could go a long way to explaining some experiences. Perhaps. 
There's an ancient Iroquois Indian legend in the USA. According to this legend, these kids could be a being called an Otcon. In their belief system, they talk about a good and a bad energy. The name for the positive energy was called Orinda, the negative energy Otcon. A broad term for negative energy, beings, forces and things that live in the world around us, as well as trying to penetrate this world from the underworld, the skies or other dimensions of reality. The Otcon was considered by the Iroquois nation as an evil energy that could possess and destroy people, objects and animals. They felt that this energy could take on the form of a human and mate with a human woman, resulting in the birth of a child with pure black eyes and very chalky coloured skin. These black-eyed kids generally never lived more than a day or two after birth, as they were usually killed by the tribal elders and burned to prevent resurrection. It was said that children who found themselves lost or alone in the woods became an easy target for possession by an otcon, that when they found their way back to the tribe that they came back empty, with black eyes replacing their normal ones. They were said to behave in peculiar manners, pacing around, repeating themselves frequently, and generally causing havoc amongst the tribe's people, as their goal was to destroy the tribe and replace the members with Otcon. Sounds like a familiar horror story, whose name escapes me at the moment, about kids with shining eyes. They were also said to be mean and ferocious, once possessed by the Otcon, often having a taste for human flesh. So, with this native legend, you can see that stories of black-eyed kids have been around for a very, very long time, far before modern history when they came into general public knowledge. Oh yes, I remember the name of that movie now. It was from 1960 and was called Village of the Damned. For those interested, Rotten Tomatoes gives that movie a four and a half star rating out of five. Having a wee bit of background on the black-eyed kids, how did they come into mainstream knowledge these days? One of the first people to mention and to document having had an encounter with black-eyed kids in actual life was Brian Bethel. He published a transcript of what happened on his blog. At around 9.30pm on the 16th of January 1998, Brian left his home in Abilene, Texas to pay an internet bill. On the way, he stopped at the Dollar Movie Theatre that was next to his internet provider's office, using the glow of the theatre lights to write out his cheque. As he was busy doing this, he was startled by a persistent knocking on his car window. Looking up, he saw two small boys that he estimated were between 10 and 14 years old. He described the boys in this manner, quote, Boy number one was slightly taller than, than his companion, wearing a pullover hooded shirt with a sort of grey checked pattern and jeans. I couldn't see his shoes. His skin was olive coloured and had curly, medium length brown hair. He exuded an air of quiet confidence. Boy number two had pale skin with a trace of freckles. His primary characteristic seemed to be looking around nervously. He was dressed in a similar manner to his companion, but his pullover was a light green colour. His hair was sort of pale orange. They didn't appear to be related, at least directly. Brown says, I was immediately gripped by an incomprehensible, soul-racking fear. I had no idea why. End quote. And he knew something was up. After opening the window only a small crack, the first lad began to tell him that they wanted to see a movie shown in the theatre but had forgotten their money. He then asked Brian for a lift to their home to get the money that they needed. Brian was extremely hesitant and nervous and the first boy continued to try and persuade him saying things like, Come on mister, we just want to go to our house and we're just two little boys. Come on mister, let us in, we can't get into your car until you do, you know. Just let us in and we'll be gone before you know it. We'll go to our mother's house. Brian continues, quote, All the while, the spokesman uttering assurances, it wouldn't take long. They were just two little kids. They didn't have a gun or anything. The last part was a bit unnerving. In the short time I had broken the gaze of the spokesman, something had changed and my mind exploded in a vortex of all-consuming terror. Both boys stared at me with cold black eyes, soulless orbs like two great swaths of starless night. 
I full-on freaked out inside while trying to appear sane and calm. I made whatever excuses came to mind, all of them designed to get me the hell out of there. I wrapped my hand around the gear shift through the car into reverse and began to roll up the window, apologising all the while. My fear must have been evident. The boy in the back wore a look of confusion. The spokesman banged sharply on the window as I rolled it up. His words, full of anger, echoed in my mind, even today. We can't come in unless you tell us it's okay. Let us in. I drove out of the parking lot in blind fear, and I'm surprised I didn't sideswipe a car or two along the way. I stole a quick look in my rear view mirror before peeling out into the night. The boys were gone. Even if they had run... I don't believe there was any place they could have hidden from view that quickly. Brian following, sharing this experience publicly, also heard about a friend's experience that same year shared via a message board, which I will share later in the episode. After Brian shared his experience, paranormal investigation groups received many reports similar to his experience, but of course there was no physical evidence of such encounters, nor actually were there any reports of any hoaxes exposed for trying to capitalise on these experiences by portraying themselves as such. So, the stories of encounters with these kids spread, with many common elements like, it's generally but not always night when these encounters take place, the person approached by these kids is always going about their normal activities or at home for the evening. They all, without exception, felt extreme fear and anxiety, way beyond what would normally be expected, and most of them all drove away, shut their doors or otherwise got out of the situation just in time. In 2013, the Snopes.com website reported that they felt there was an aspect of viral marketing going on. Quote, Black-eyed children fever hit the internet in February 2013 when a two-minute video episode of Weekly Strange featuring a look at these strange putative beings was posted to the entertainment section of the MSN website. Not surprisingly, the appearance of the Black-eyed children video on MSN coincided with the release of Black-eyed Kids, an urban legend-based horror film. End quote. But, as we have already discussed, the appearance of black-eyed kids was noted way in advance of any viral marketing campaign. Certainly, I feel that Hollywood and the entertainment industry have taken the theme of the black-eyed kids and run with it, but did they create it? No. I personally don't believe this to be the case, and here is why. Around 25 years ago, give or take a few years, I used to live in the centre of the North Island of New Zealand in a university town called Hamilton in the Waikato district. One day, one of my good friends, and for privacy issues I'm not using their real names, Mark came to see me because he knew I had an interest in these subjects. He wanted to share an experience that had occurred to his strapping 18-year-old son Peter a few days previously. Now, Mark's son Peter was a football player, big strapping lad, who also helped his dad building houses, so he was a strong, robust, fit, healthy, regular teenager. Not much shook him up. But Mark said Peter was absolutely terrified, and he had never, ever seen his son like this in his life. This got my attention. Here, to the best of my recollection, is what happened. And I recall it because it was so unusual, unusual in his son's behaviour, which I had personally never observed and neither had his dad, and unusual because of where it happened. Peter had gone with his mates to a remote swimming hole at a place called Kuni Whanifa, near Mount Porongia. This was a fairly isolated area, but quite popular with the locals, with a number of walking tracks around the area. Whilst his mates were swimming at the waterhole, he decided to go for a walk along the track beside the river. This was a normal summer day, in the middle of the day. Warm, pleasant, clear skies. Nothing untoward. So Peter was walking along, just enjoying the day and the natural beauty that surrounded him, the sounds of the narrow river running alongside of him as he walked. He, at this stage, had been walking by himself for maybe about 20 minutes when all of a sudden he became aware of a kid on the other side of the river, on the river bank. At that point, the river was only maybe eight feet wide. 
much narrow in other parts. This part of the river was not wide at all, and it was not a deep river, except for the swimming hole, and it was always cool being fed from the mount. So there he was, just enjoying his day, his solitude, and his walk. When, out of the corner of his eye, he spotted a kid, Peter described him as being young, perhaps eight to ten years old. This made him stop, because it was a fairly isolated area where he was. And there had been no other cars parked, or that had arrived at the parking areas, which could be seen from the swimming hole, while the boys had been at the swimming hole. So he was briefly a little confused about how this kid got here in the middle of nowhere with no family around that he could see. He was concerned that the boy was separated or lost from his family, so he wanted to help him. But even more than that, he was becoming very aware of a growing feeling of unease and fear. Now you have to understand, at this time in New Zealand, our country was far safer than it is these days. And not only that, we have no dangerous animals on land that could create fear. No snakes, cougars or other predators that could harm humans. As this feeling of fear and anxiety grew, he turned to face the boy, to ask him if he was lost, did he need any help? By this stage, the boy keeping pace with him, walking on his side of the river, they had reached a part of the river where it was very narrow. Now that he was actually facing the lad, he was able to observe his very pale skin. He was very anemic looking, was how Peter described his pallor. At this point, the kid had been looking down, but as he asked him if he was okay, the kid looked up, and to his horror, Peter said his eyes were completely black. He said there was no colour at all in his eyes. Then the fear hit him like a physical punch in the stomach, and all thoughts of concern for the kid disappeared, and he was aware of feeling an immediate danger and of overwhelming terror. He was also aware of how far he was away from all his mates and he turned and began running to return to the relative safety of all his friends, all the while keeping an eye on the kid on the other side of the river. As he began to run, he noticed that the kid was pacing him, so he sped up as fast as he could run, but the kid was keeping pace with him. At this point in time, he became genuinely scared for his safety as he was a very fit kid, a sportsman, light on his feet and a fast runner. But this kid was pacing him. He says he was so scared that he was actually crying as he ran. What teenage male in that era would ever admit that unless they were beyond scared? He eventually came to a point in the river where there was a bend and a thicket of trees and bushes on both sides. When he came around the bend and the trees cleared, he could no longer see the kid but also he could now hear his mate splashing about in the water not 200 yards away. However, he didn't stop running until he reached his mates, who, when they became aware of his presence, immediately became concerned about his obvious distress. Mark said that his son was white and still shaking when he arrived home, a trip of about 40 minutes. He explained to him what had happened and was very, very upset. And even several years after the experience, if I were to ask him about it, he said he immediately felt that fear again. So it was a pretty traumatising experience for him. To this day, he still feels the fear if the subject is ever brought up. But Peter is not the only one to have encountered black-eyed kids in an isolated area. David was hiking and camping when he had his encounter. I'm a 26-year-old male. I work at a small private college in Michigan. I'm a normal average guy. I like hockey, HBO shows, kayaking and hiking, camping. I have a girlfriend, love my dad and sister and have a pet dog called Bear. While I keep an open mind, I don't believe in ghosts, aliens, Bigfoot and I'm not even too sure about God. The way I see it, if I haven't encountered it firsthand or seen documented, verifiable proof, then I keep a healthy amount of scepticism. There is one thing I do believe in now that I never did before. Hell, I didn't even know about it before. Black, freaking eye kids. As I said earlier, loved to hike and camp. For reasons too introspective to get into fully here, I just love the solitude, peace and serenity the outdoors provided me. My life is not overly stressful, chaotic or dramatic. But every once in a while, a man needs to get away from it all. 
Being alone in the wilderness gave me the opportunity to clear my head, be introspective, consider the facts of life. I loved the beauty of the natural world and I tried to appreciate the small and big things from the smallest clover to the biggest mountain. Beauty is all around us in a way. I think it's my belief in beauty that has helped me to cope as well as I have with what I am about to share. In late August of 2010, I set out for the Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, located along Lake Michigan. I had scheduled five days off work and I planned on making the most of it. Sleeping Bear is one of my favourite parts in Lower Michigan. I know it to be a great place for some solitude and having usually been abandoned by sun worshippers by mid-August, I knew I'd have most of the park to myself. So I wasn't surprised when I arrived the first day, found my usual parking spot, a sand parking lot just yards from the lake, and didn't see another person. As I sat on the hood of my car overlooking the beach and the lake, I remember breathing deeply and saying aloud, thank God for solitude. I ate lunch, walked down to the beach and put my bare feet into the water, cold, very cold. It didn't matter to me though because I didn't come to swim, I came to hike and to camp. I came to, as was my tradition, sit by a warm fire on a cool night, sipping on my flask of whiskey, enjoying the sounds of the forest. However, this peaceful tradition didn't happen. The proper procedure when camping at a state or national park, if you've never been, is to check in at a ranger station. And there you pay your fees, obtain your backcountry pass. If you're going to be camping in the backcountry, as I always do, and give the rangers your information, license, plate, number, make and model of your car, etc. After my quick stop off at the beach to eat my lunch, I headed to the nearby, a 15 or so minute drive, and get my affairs in order. The Plate River Ranger Station is manned until mid-October, I think, so it was open and I didn't have to travel to the main station, a half hour drive north. I park in the station's parking lot and walk into the office. The ranger and I spoke for a little and he asked me for my license plate number. I knew he was going to ask, but I still forgot to write it down when I went in. So I walk back out towards my car and I see two kids sitting at a bench just in front of where I'm parked. They weren't there when I parked and I didn't notice them when I walked into the station. But at this point in time, I'm still on cloud nine. I'm happy to be on vacation, so I take no real notice. I walk back to my car, jot down the license plate number and walk back to the office. I take care of business in the office and step out and walk to the connecting bathroom. The back country area I'm staying at White Pine has a pit toilet. Think Porter John, but just with a deep hole in the ground. But I like to use a real bathroom while I can. I go into the restroom and go into the empty stall. As I'm taking care of my business, I hear the bathroom door open. I hear whispered voices. It's a small bathroom, but I can't make out what the voices are saying. I can tell the kids' voices, though, and I figure it's the kids I saw near my car earlier. No biggie, right? I finish up and open the stall door. Sure enough, there are two kids standing outside the stall. I remember saying, it's all yours, as I walked to the sink. The kids just stood there. When you think about it, Now, the situation seems a little spooky, but at the time, and if you were in the situation yourself, I bet that you wouldn't be the slightest bit worried, and neither was I. I washed my hands and glanced in the mirror, only to notice the kids are looking right at me. This is the first time, but certainly not the last time on this trip, that my spine tingles with fear. The goddamn kids have completely black eyes, no whites to their eyes at all. Like I said, this is a pretty small bathroom and they were not more than three feet away. At first I I can't do or say anything. I'm literally frozen with fear. The water runs over my hands but I can't feel it. I'm so deep inside my head at this moment that all I can hear are my thoughts which was something like, (gasps) ah, all joking aside, I was petrified. It was only when one of the kids, a brown head boy, that I would guess was around 12, took a step toward me that my fight or flight instincts took over control from my fear. I turned off the water, why I bothered, I don't know, habit I guess, and moved a step back from the kids and toward the door. Seemingly sensing my fear, the boy didn't take another step toward me. Instead he stopped. On retrospect, I can guess he was trying to keep from frightening me too much. Didn't work, kid. Can you help us? That's what the boy said when one of us finally spoke. 
For a moment, I did want to help. I consider myself a pretty nice guy. I'd go out of my way to help pregnant women carry groceries to their car. I'd rescue cats from trees if the situation arose. And for a while, I thought, that is why I wanted to help those creepy kids. I thought my sheer decency was what made me, despite my better judgment and despite my fear, want to help them. Only since I began researching the black-eyed kids do I realise that I didn't want to help those kids. But whatever magical, mystical, voodoo power they have made me want to help them. I can't tell you with any certainty how long I stood motionless thinking about helping those kids, but it seemed like an eternity. Finally, like a physical shaking of my brain, I said, no, not right now, I've got to go. And then I left the bathroom. I remember that in those two seconds my back was turned on, those kids to me leaving the bathroom, I felt certain I was going to die. I thought as soon as my back was turned they were going to tear me to shreds. It was with knee-buckling relief that I left the bathroom and walked out into the midday sun. I walked the 15 or so feet to my car on noodle-like legs, too afraid to look behind me. I fumbled for my keys and unlocked my door, sat down, closed the door and locked it. Only then, in the safety of my locked car, did I feel safe enough to look back toward the bathroom, damned as the little bastards weren't standing just outside the bathroom, staring at me with the big black soul-sucking eyes. I want to take a moment to explain a little bit more about myself. I'm not a big man, I'm not small either, I'm six foot with shoes on. I always say, and am around 185 pounds. What I'm saying is I can take a couple of 12-year-olds in a fight, I assume, having never actually fought any 12-year-olds since I was 12 myself. In my hiking, I've encountered odd people before. I've turned a bend in a trail only to startle a huge grizzly bear. I've been lost once and ran out of water once. And I even had a tree fall in the middle of my campsite during a gale sweep night in Tennessee as I was drifting off to sleep. However, not a single event in my life scared me nearly as much as those kids. So there I am in my car staring at the kids and them staring at me. I couldn't take my stare away from them and they start for the car. Startled to my senses, I turn the key, throw it in reverse and get the hell out of there. I drive off not daring to look in the rearview mirror. I know that if I do look back that I'll see those black eyes looking back at me. I turn onto the main road and head the short drive north to my campsite. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Why the hell are you still camping? To be honest, I can't tell you why. I was just so much in shock that I wasn't really thinking. It wasn't until I parked in the sand lot at the head of the White Pine Trail that my brain started functioning again. The drive home would only take three hours. I could make it home in time for dinner. But for some reason I talked myself out of it. Sitting in my car, in the sun, on the beach, has a way of taking away all bad feelings. I just talked away my better judgment. I won't be doing that again. It's around three o'clock and I know that the sun will start to set in around three or four hours. So I know I should head toward my camping spot. It's not a very long walk from the parking lot to the White Pine backcountry campground, but it will take around 45 minutes, leaving me just a couple of hours to set up camp, gather firewood, cook dinner and eat before nightfall. Fuck it, I remember saying to myself. I get my backpack out of my back seat and take off down the trail. Now, there are two ways to access the White Pine campground from where I was parked. I could either head through the woods or I could walk along the beach. The water trail is quicker and shorter and the beach trail is harder on the legs and lungs. Walking with a 50 pound pack in the sand is no picnic. However, considering what I just went through, I decided to go along the beach. It was the more open, brighter, kinder trail. To reach the campsite from the beach trail, you have to turn away from the lake and go about half a mile into the woods. Reaching my campsite, I find it, unfortunately, completely empty. The campground has seven sites, I think, and not one of them was taken. Usually this would be a happy thing for me, but this time I wished for all my might for a little company. I pick a site hidden fairly well from the trail, feeling that I didn't need anyone walking along to spot my tent. I unpack and set up my ultralight one-person tent, put down my sleeping pad and unroll my zero-degree rated mummy bag. 
Taking my walking stick, a sword of hockey stick and a folding knife with me, I head into the forest to gather firewood. I pile up a good sized pile, three times larger than I think I'll need, and proceed to light a fire. I cook my food and eat, all the while watching the sun set through the trees. What is a normally beautiful warming sight to me now only brings dread. I do not want to be out here, I suddenly realise. I finish eating quickly and decide to gather even more firewood. I don't want to run out in the middle of the night. As the darkness descends upon the woods in my campsite, I get the fire going and rifle through my pack looking for my flask. This was the situation that called for a little liquid courage. I hit it hard. In the woods, the sun sets at first slower than you think, and then near the end of it, it just kind of falls out of the sky and is gone in a blink. So it did that night. Sitting next to the fire, I decided to move my tent closer to me. So I click on my flashlight and move my tent until it is right behind the small bench next to the fire ring. I like having the tent behind me, protecting my back as I saw it. I'm glad I decided to gather more firewood because I'm burning through it quickly, keeping the fire as high as I am. Even though it's early autumn and the temperature is probably in the 40s, I was hot sitting so close to such a big fire. Part of getting away from it all for me is to leave my phone in the car. In civilization, I don't use a watch, I just look at my cell. However, this night, I wish I had my cell on me. Not to call someone, there's no service, but to check the time. I wanted it to be late. I wanted the night to fly by and give me the security of morning. I finished the whiskey and wished that I had brought the bottle with me from the car. The spirits had done their job though and I was a bit calmer. Also, praise be to God, I was feeling sleepy too. Though the rules say don't go to bed with your fire burning, I sure as hell was not going to sleep with the fire out. I got in my tent leaving the flap open with just the bug flap closed so I could see the fire and tried to sleep. I don't know how long I lay there before sleep found me but I did eventually drift off. Thankfully, I can't remember having any dreams. I woke to a dead fire and the early dusk light coming in. I have to say, I was slightly surprised to be alive. As the dawn turned into day, I felt more and more foolish for the fear I felt yesterday. Being usually a calm, cool and collected guy, I couldn't explain the intense dread and fear I felt when I saw those kids. But I did my best to ignore it and I explained away their eyes pretty easily. I told myself the kids were camping at the Platte River campground, same location as the ranger station I registered at. They had some coloured contact lenses and were playing a joke. Simple, possible, even probably considering the alternative. I ate breakfast and then made a, upon high sight, horrible decision. I decided to stay another night. After breakfast I gathered firewood so that I wouldn't have to gather any when I got back for the evening. My pile of wood at a towering height, I hiked back to my car along the wooded trail. I was feeling awfully, stupidly brave that morning. I arrived at my car and decided to go to the dune climb. The dune climb is a trail that begins at a towering dune and ends one and a half miles away at Lake Michigan. This hike was uneventful but beautiful, providing me with even more determination not to let myself be scared off by some stupid kids with contact lenses. I got back to my car from the round trip hike around one. I got out my small camp stove and cooked some soup. Finished with lunch, I decided that next I would take the scenic drive. I forget the name of the road that is part of the Sleeping Dunes National Lakeshore. It's a winding drive with several scenic and educational pull-offs. It's relaxing and beautiful. I finished with that around three and decided I would head to Traverse City just a 45 minute drive away and do a little shopping and grab an early dinner at a nice steakhouse. This is not something I normally do while camping, but after the previous night's events, I decided to treat myself. I went to the steakhouse just outside of Traverse around 4.30. Fragrine, a quick dinner, a 45 minute drive and an hour walk would get me to my camp at just about dusk, but that's not what happened. The restaurant was packed. I got a table fairly quickly, but the service was very slow. In the end, I didn't get out of the restaurant until dusk. Cursing myself, it began to rain as I drove back to the trailhead parking lot. By the time I was at the lot and parked, it was full-blown night time. Sitting in the parking lot, listening to the wind and rain, I was pretty damn scared again. I think that if nearly all of my gear wasn't still at the campsite, I would have just drove home and said screw it. 
However, I couldn't abandon several hundred dollars worth of camping equipment because I was scared I'm not a pussy. I gear up, flashlight, pocket knife, water bottle, headlamp and walking stick. Again, I had two options, through the woods or along the beach. The storm clouds blocked out most of the star moonlight, so I would have been kidding myself to think that the beach would have been better lit. But it was still more open and provided me with a better feeling, so I took the beach path. The path is only a mile and a half along the beach, and then another half mile into the woods to the campsite. I figured if I hustled, I'd be at my campsite in just over half an hour. I turn on my headlamp and move off down the beach. The wind is hitting pretty hard, and it's pretty damn cold, but I'm prepared. My coat has a nice rain shell, and I'm not getting too wet. Hiking in the dark is not smart in the best of circumstances. In this area, there are cougars and bear, both rare, but the real danger is getting lost or stumbling over something and injuring yourself. However, I wasn't too worried about any of that. The animals are so rare in that area, it would take very bad luck to get bothered by them, and the beach was clear of most debris that I might trip on. What had me worried was the creeping sensation of paranoia. As I walked, the sensation of paranoia and dread grew. I stopped every ten feet or so to look around, lighting the tall grass next to the beach and before the woods with my headlamp. I opened my jaw and listened. You can hear better with your mouth slightly open, but I saw nothing and heard nothing. I'd walk another ten feet and just know that someone was watching me. It was hard to hear anything over the lapping waves of the lake and the howling wind of the storm, but I swear I heard voices in the tall grass. I'd been walking probably half an hour and I knew I would be meeting off with the trail leading into the woods and to my campsite any second now, but then my world fell apart. Having one of my strongest moments of feeling watched, I turned around, facing the direction I came, and there they were. The boy who spoke to me earlier couldn't have been more than five feet away and the other boy, the quiet boy, was standing slightly behind him. Each of the boys stood motionless, staring, just staring. At this moment, I'm not sure I have the ability to put my terror into words. The best way I can describe it is to say, I felt like I was dying. I felt like I was in the hospital and the doctor had just told me I had moments to live. The talkative boy moved toward me. The only light on the beach came from my headlamp. Neither kid had any sort of flashlight. My LED beam flashed across their faces, reflecting grotesquely in their large, dark eyes. The waves crashed and the wind blew. Help us. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I could barely breathe. The boy moved closer. The quiet boy stepped to the side, almost like he was slowly circling behind me, and that broke the spell. I'm not fucking helping you, I said. We're lost. We can't find our campsite. Is this a game? I asked, even though I knew it wasn't. Take us with you, please. We'll die out here. We're afraid. I call bullshit on that one. You're scared, I thought to myself. I'm scared. You're the one with the creepy eyes, the vacant hollow voices. You're the ones with the fisheye stare. The quiet boy moved a little more. He was now standing beside me, just a couple of feet away. The talkative boy was still in front of me, blocking the way I had come, blocking the path back to my car. Then things got even weirder. Okay, you can come with me, I said. I don't even remember thinking the words, they just came out. The talkative boy smiled and he reached to take my hand. The fight or flight response hit me so hard it was like a physical punch to the stomach. I recalled at the sight of this little monster trying to take my hand. Before I even realised that I'm running down the beach, I'm sprinting away from the little bastards and my car as fast as I can. I don't look behind me. I don't know if they're following me or not and I don't want to know. All I know is that I need to run faster. I'm in decent shape, but given any normal circumstances, I would never have been able to run so quickly for so long on a beach. My headlamp bouncing up and down, I see the offshoot trail leading from the beach into the woods. Without much thought, if any, I take the trail and head into the woods. My senses finally returning to me, I jump off the trail and move a little ways into the woods. I turn off my headlamp and lie down among some tall grass. I watch the trail, waiting to see the kids following. I waited in the rain and cold for God knows how long, a couple of hours at least, no kids. The cold was slowly creeping in. I wasn't sure if I was shivering because of the adrenaline, the fear or the cold, but I do know I was starting to freeze. I had to leave my concealment and make way to shelter. I had two options, the tent and sleeping bag or the car. 
The car meant safety, it meant home. However, it also meant that I would have to walk a mile and a half in the dark with God knows who or what waiting for me. The tent meant warmth and shelter from the elements. It meant exposure to the kids if the kids knew where I was hiking. And when, then, they'd know where I was camping, right? It was an impossible decision. It was a choice of the lesser of two evils. I chose the tent. I just couldn't force myself to go back along the wooded trail and I sure as hell wasn't going to go back along the beach. I crossed my fingers and prayed that the little bastards didn't know where my tent was. I got up, found the trail and sprinted the half mile to the campground. And as I ran, a thought occurred. Maybe someone will have hiked in during the day. Maybe I'll have company. There was no life at the campground. When I arrived, I made a wild circle of it looking both for other campers and for the little devils. I saw nothing and no one. I made my way as quietly as possible to my tent. I unzipped the fly and crawled in. I thought briefly about a fire, but decided that would be more of a signal to the kids than deterrence. My clothes were sopping wet and I was still very cold, but I had to take them off. My pack is leaning against a tree about 15 feet from my tent. Inside are clean, dry clothes, sealed tightly in a wet bag. However, now that I'm inside the tent, I'm sure as hell not going back out. The tent gave me a sense of security, even though it wasn't in any way secure. Now naked, I crawl inside my mummy bag. I'd like to say how much I hate that it's called a mummy bag. After a few moments, I warm up, but the shivering takes another third of an hour or so to subside. As I'm lying there, I'm wishing so much that I had that bottle of whiskey in my car. The rain plays against the leaves on the trees and the wind creaks the branches. Under the best of circumstances, this is a night where a person's mind can get away from them. For me, it was utter terror. My imagination made every creak, every howl of the wind into something sinister. As the hours passed and my adrenaline faded, I felt immensely tired. I wanted so badly just to fall asleep. In sleep, I wouldn't know I was being evacerated. I'd either wake up or I wouldn't. I thought it was a nightmare at first when I heard a voice say something. I thought I was dreaming. But then sleep cleared from my head and I realised I was awake. It was still night and the storm was still biting. Help us, an unmistakable voice said. I couldn't help it. It was a gut reaction. I screamed. I lay naked. My mummy bag zipped up to my chin. I was completely helpless. I felt like a newborn baby, my fate completely held in the hands of others. Please let us in. No, I screeched. And then again, no. It's so cold, please let us in, mister. I stopped replying and could only sob, like a heartbroken teenage girl, like a woman who's just learned her sister died. I sobbed. I was so uncontrollably scared that I think it helped me not to pay attention to the kids' demands, at least not fully. Let us in. I tugged the pull string on the hood of my mummy bag until I was completely enveloped. I just kept repeating, not daring to listen to the words, to the kids, the word no. No, 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 no. I waited for death. I knew it was coming. Any second and I'd be ripped to shreds. The kid kept saying something, but I wasn't listening. I wouldn't listen. I knew how overwhelming their hypnotic power was. I did everything I could not to listen. I kept chanting my mantra, kept howling my nose. I don't know when I fell asleep, but the next thing I know, I startle awake. The sun is shining and I'm alive. I don't know how, but I'm alive. I look around my small tent and I don't see anything amiss on the inside. It takes me several minutes to gather the courage necessary to unzip the tent fly, but finally I do. I peek my head out but see no one. Naked, I run to my pack and grab my clothes in the dry bag. I toss some clothes on and race back to the tent. I tear it down in a matter of moments. I pack my sleeping bag and pad and tent into my pack and take off down the trail. I decide one more time to take the beach trail. In the sun and the warmth of the morning, it's an entirely different trail. The only moment I'm given pause is when I come across a duck with what seems to be its heart torn out. I took a photo with a disposal camera in my pack and move on. I arrive at my car and find it unmolested. I get in and drive home. It's been almost two entire months since this happened, but I still remember it all like it was yesterday. I haven't gone camping since, and I don't know if I'll ever feel safe hiking again. Maybe I'll go camping again sometime in the future, but I'm bringing a friend. No more going it alone. Thankfully, I haven't seen any more black-eyed kids. I don't want to posit on what they are. I don't want to think about whether they are demons, monsters, aliens, or hybrids. 
I was interested at first. I did some research because I wanted to know if I was crazy. I don't care what you think they are. I don't care what they are. I just want to know that I wasn't the only one who has had this experience. I'm not, and I'm thankful for that. My advice, if you ever do encounter a black-eyed kid, don't listen to it. Don't listen to it speak. Don't be polite in case they are just weird kids. Don't question their validity. Don't worry about looking silly or that others will think you're crazy. Just run. Run and don't look back. Here are some other encounters that have happened during the day. Lee from my Walk in the Shadowlands Facebook group had this brief experience with what she believed may have been black-eyed kids. I'm not sure if it's black-eyed kids though or something else. I was doing some work on a farm and on the tree line I saw two children playing. It was miles from anywhere so I yelled at, Hey, what are you doing? The children turned around but something was wrong with their eyes. The children ran into the bush and something told me don't follow. They had an extremely horrible feeling about them, so I didn't follow and carried on with my day. Marcus, also from my Facebook group, shares this experience. I had an experience when I was eight or nine back in Zimbabwe before I moved to New Zealand. My parents were at work and I was home alone. Two children were knocking at the door. I opened the door, but luckily I forgot to undo the chain. When I looked at their eyes, I felt dread and gut-wrenching fear. They looked like they were five or six years old. Their eyes were so black, completely black. I quickly slammed the door and locked it, but they started banging the door and tried looking through the windows. I hid under the blankets until my parents got home. I'll never forget it. Still gives me chills to this day. This is an account from a marine who uses the handle Reaper 3-1. I'm a marine stationed at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. I live in the infantry barracks off River Road. I recently had a rather strange encounter with a pair of black-eyed kids. I live on the third floor of the barracks that have open walkways on the outside and rooms on the inside. This happened on a weekend back in November 2009. It was a weekend so almost every marine was out, either home, drinking or sleeping. Only a handful were left in the barracks awake. I'd stayed that weekend because I was broke and had no money to go out. I was watching a movie when I heard a knock at my door, figuring it was my roommate who'd lost his key again. I went and opened it. Instead of a drunken roommate, I found two little kids standing on the walkway. Only these kids freaked the hell out of me. I don't know what it was about them, but as a Marine, we're always told to listen to that little voice in your head because it might just save your life from an IED, improvised explosive device. Right then, that voice was screaming at me to shut the door and lock it. There was also the fact that these kids had absolutely pitch black eyes. I mean, no white or any other colour to them whatsoever, just black. But I pushed those things aside and asked them what they were doing there so late. They responded by saying that it was really cold out and they wanted to come in and read. I was confused as hell because I've never met a kid that wants to read. Also, there was no mention of any parents or anything you'd expect the lost couple of kids to say. I couldn't take my eyes off their pitch black eyes. It was like they were sucking me in. I felt horrible and was suddenly frightened for my life like I needed to immediately take cover. They just stared at me with those goddamned eyes. I took a quick look up and down the walkway to see if any other marines were out, but there was nobody in sight. I turned back to the kids who I noticed had taken a step forward toward me. I got the feeling like I was being hunted, like these kids were predators and out for their next meal or something. 
instinct gave way to reason and I decided to listen to that voice and shut the door and locked it. I heard soft, constant knocking for the next five minutes before I heard my window rattle and then nothing. I went down to the officer on duty the next morning and asked him about it and he said he hadn't heard or seen any kids in the area at all and dismissed it saying that I'd probably had too much to drink last night, only I hadn't been drinking at all or anything like that. I don't know who or what those kids were, but I doubt any of the families here would let their kids wander around at night on a military base. Here we've had some stories of black-eyed kids outside, not being invited into actually anywhere. But what happens if you actually let these kids into your home? In January 2016, a report appeared on the internet said to have come from an unnamed woman who had not only encountered black-eyed children, but made the mistake of allowing them into her home. According to the report, it was a decision that she believed would have lasting implications. This is her story as sent into the Week in Weird website. Let me start by saying that I know how hard all this will be to believe, but now that things have taken a turn for the worse, I started looking for stories similar to mine and found Week in Weird. I feel like I should share this story with someone I made the mistake of letting the black-eyed kids inside and now I'm worried that I might die because of it. I hope this will be a warning to everyone who is ever in the position to make the same mistake that I did. I live just outside of a rural town in Vermont. It's a tight-knit community where everyone knows one another and people don't lock their doors at night. There's never been any need to. A little over a year ago, I woke up because I heard a loud banging on my front door. At the time, my husband and I lived in a small home on a dirt road just off the rural route into town. It was in the middle of a snowstorm and the nearby hills get very slippery in the snow, so I thought that someone might have been in an accident and broken down. It's happened before. When I looked out the window, I could see that our motion spotlight was on. I could see that there were footprints in the snow that had come from our road and into our driveway, but there was no car anywhere. The snow was still covering the road and no one had driven on it for at least a couple of hours. Our front door was obscured from the window but I could see that someone was standing there. I wasn't sure what to think so I woke my husband up just to feel safer. While I was telling him what was going on the banging on the door started again and my husband went to answer it while I stood in the hallway. When he opened the door there were two children standing in the snow looking toward the ground. They were a boy and a girl and could not have been more than eight years old. They were dressed strangely and had odd haircuts. The girl's hair was very long and straight and the boy had a dated haircut that looked almost like a bowl cut. They weren't dressed for winter and my first thought was that they must have been Mennonite children. But as far as I know, there was never a large community of Mennonites near us. Thinking back on it, I know my normal reaction to seeing children in a snowstorm would have been to rush them inside and bundle them up with some blankets and hot cocoa, but that's not how this felt. The children were very unnerving, they would not make eye contact and when my husband asked them if everything was okay, they asked if they could come in. My husband looked at me like, what do I do? And I asked the kids where their parents were. They'll be here soon, is all they said. It was around two o'clock in the morning at this point, so the only reasonable thought in my head was that there must have been an accident or these kids got lost. As much as my instincts told me not to bring them inside, I did it anyway. I went into the kitchen to make them some hot cocoa while my husband took them into the living room. While I was fixing the kettle, I could hear my husband talking to the kids. He was asking them if they were okay, where they came from, how far they walked, if their parents' car was broken down, things like that. But they always answered, our parents will be here soon. They spoke in a sing-songy voice. They weren't afraid to be in a stranger's home at all. I started to notice that our cats, we had four, were all hiding except Pigeon, who was in the kitchen with me. Normally our cats are very curious and friendly and we have to be careful that they don't run out the door when we leave. This time, none of them even tried to see who was here, which I thought was very strange. When I walked back into the living room, the kids were sitting on the couch, as still as can be, but my husband was holding his head in his hands. I asked him what was wrong and he just said that he felt very dizzy all of a sudden, but that he was fine. 
I turned back to the children to give them their cocoa, but when they looked at me, I gasped. It took everything inside of me not to drop the mugs and run away. When they looked at me, their eyes were completely black. They had no whites, just giant black pupils. When they saw that I was scared, they stood up and asked if they could use the bathroom. I tried to be as composed as I could be and showed them down the hall. They went into the bathroom together and I hurried back to my husband to ask him if he had seen their eyes. He'd seen them too and he said that it looked like his brother's badly bruised eyes after a car accident. We were in the middle of talking about whose children they could be when my husband's nose started to bleed. He'd never had nosebleeds as long as I'd known him. I just knew inside that this had something to do with the kids in the bathroom and I started crying while I ran to get my husband some tissues. That's when the power went out. I heard my husband yell my name from the living room and as I started to walk back through the hallway I stopped dead in my tracks. The two children were standing at the end of the hallway. They weren't moving and I have never been so scared in my whole life. They just stood there in the dark. After what felt like forever the boy said our parents are here and they walked to the door opened it and walked out leaving it wide open. My husband jumped up to go close it and almost fell over. We looked out the window and saw two men standing by a black car idling at the end of our driveway. The men looked like they were wearing black coloured suits and were very tall, at least six feet. When my husband waved at them, they just stared at us, got into the car and drove off. Our power came on about half an hour later, but nothing was the same after that. Over the next few months, three of our cats went missing. We can only assume that they ran away somewhere and never came back. But the worst thing was coming home to find Pigeon in a puddle of blood on the living room floor. He looked like he'd been vomiting blood. The vet told us that he had some kind of hemorrhage. After my husband's nosebleeds became a regular occurrence, we went to see the doctor. He didn't know what to make of it other than dry nasal passages. But my husband was diagnosed with an aggressive skin cancer. When the doctor asked us if he'd used tanning beds, we both thought he was joking. But apparently this kind of melanoma is linked to overuse of indoor tanning. The doctors think he'll recover but don't understand how it got so bad so quickly. My husband has never worked an outdoor job and spends relatively little time in the sun. Since we've let the black-eyed kids inside our home, I've also suffered from regular dizzy spells and nosebleeds on a regular basis. I've had other issues which I won't mention here but trust me when I say that I am suddenly in the worst condition of my life and no one can do anything about it. I know that all of this is because I let the black-eyed children into my home. We've told everyone we could about the strange kids that showed up that night but no one else saw them and some laugh at how scared we were of the Mennonite kids but we know what we saw. I wish my husband had never opened the door. Finally, John Walthwood's experience as shared on a message board with journalist Brian Bethel in 1998. I was down in Portland, Oregon after a seminar series on software development. I'd grabbed a bite of dinner about 10pm and when I left it was about 11ish. I'd got in my car, locked and belted up, and just started the engine when someone tapped on my window. I was in an above-ground garage on the third floor, so I wasn't too freaked. Good lighting, still some people around. It was one of the guys from the conference, so I rolled down my window and asked him what was up. He wanted to ride around the block a few times as he was freaked about who was standing outside his car. I figured, so sue me, that it was some of Portland's homeless or some punker kids. So, being a good Samaritan, I let him in and we took off. We drove by his car and there were three kids around it. Two boys and a girl. The girl was weird, just freaky, you know, clothes and hair and makeup, gothomatic. The two kids were, I don't know, just scary as shit. She was probably 14 or 15. The oldest boy was probably 14-ish and the youngest between 10 and 12. She looked bored and was smoking a cigarette. The two boys were just leaning against the car. They looked way too intense for kids. Anyway, I started itching behind my eyes like I needed to really look at them. So like an ass, I slowed down. Big mistake. The two boys sauntered over and the girl stayed against the car. The oldest was on Duck's side, the guy from the seminar, and the youngest was on mine. I made sure the doors were locked. I love electronic locks and asked why they were standing around his car. 
The young one said, it's scary out there all alone and we just wanted a ride home. The oldest one said, you'd promised you'd help us out and Doug said, I don't even know you. By this time, I was really on edge. I felt caught between throwing up and jazzing. Adrenaline does that to me. All of a sudden, Doug said he was getting out of the car and I told him not to. As soon as he reached for the handle, the two kids, I don't know how to say this right. They looked a lot older. Their faces were, their faces were somewhat drawn and their eyes were solid black, edge to edge. No pupil, no iris, nothing. Just a liquid black pool. I just about wet myself. Slapped the car into reverse and burned rubber back in about 60 feet away. They started running after the car so I spun around one of the sports struts and we took off. I kid you not. I was convinced that if they got a hold of the car I was going to die and not in anything approaching a pleasant fashion. Anyway, the oldest one was at the bottom of the garage when we came out and almost made it to my side door. We'd gone down from the third floor doing 30-ish, maybe 35 around the ramp. He'd beaten us down the stairs and onto the sidewalk. And when I turned to look, nothing. He was gone. Doug just about passed out. All of a sudden, the feeling of menace left. We went back about 10 minutes later. Nobody was around his car. He got out, got in his car and drove home. He said that he'd met the young one early in the evening and had said he'd taken home, had even given him a short ride in his car to the seminar and told him to wait. Apparently, though, the older brother scared him, so he felt that all bets were off. I was behind him about 45 feet when the feeling of menace hit again. At that moment, Doug misjudged going across an intersection on a yellow light and his car was hit by a truck. He was killed instantly. I gave a police report and the whole time felt really freaked out and very exposed. I got back into my car, got in, locked the door and waited. I saw the kids again from about two blocks away. I'm not making it up. I'm not thinking they were vampires or something like that, but they weren't as pale, they weren't as skinny, and they felt a damn sight more menacing. I left quickly. My only concern now, though, is that this upcoming Wednesday, I'm going back to the area for another seminar, and I won't be leaving until 9.30. I'm freaked out, people. Black-eyed kids, what are they? Are they genuine? Are they merely an urban legend? Are all of these accounts I've shared with you true? The only one I can definitely vouch for is Peter's one. However, one has to ask themselves for these other experiences I have shared. What would these people who have shared their experiences have to gain? As I mentioned earlier in the episode, there are many theories as to what they are. Others are that they have a medical condition causing the changes in the eyes, but how does that account for the aura of fear they create in all of those, animals included, who experience them? There's never been a shred of physical evidence to even begin to suggest that black-eyed kids are physically present in any way, if they actually do exist. But, on the other hand, to my knowledge, there has never been any person caught creating this as a hoax to scare unknown people. My question to you all is, what do you think? Oh, hang on. Is that someone knocking at the door? Would you be brave enough to answer it? My bumper music this episode is called Dream an instrumental by Chan Mai Fat from his album Children of Soul Mountain. For more information, check out this episode's page on the podcast website at www.walkingtheshadowlands.com. If you have any suggestions for topics you might like me to cover in upcoming episodes, then please don't hesitate to contact me. Or if any of you have any questions, suggestions or any comments that you'd like to make, or experiences that you might like to share with myself or my audience, then just email me, shadowlands at yahoo.com. 
Check out our Facebook page, Walking the Shadowlands, our Instagram feed of the same name, and our Twitter feed, at Shadowlands10. Like and follow for hints on our upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a positive rating and don't be shy to leave a written review on your chosen podcasting platform or on the podcast Facebook page, Walking the Shadowlands. Who knows, you may hear your review read out at the end of one of these podcasts. And of course, so you don't miss out any episode, make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcasting platform. This podcast is available on all free podcasting platforms and from iHeartRadio as well. If you don't have a smartphone, then you can listen to the episodes from the podcast website, www.walkingtheshadowlands.com. For those hearing impaired, there's a full written transcript of each episode on the website, so you don't miss out at all. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your workmates about our show. Encourage them to listen and to subscribe also. The more, the merrier. Thank you so much for listening today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you're living in this beautiful world of ours. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Thanks for listening. 